prepared this morning. Uh, for those that are able, let's bow before our God and uh, ask him to be um, in our service and with our loved ones. Dear God, uh, we kneel before you today as an act of uh, reminding ourselves that, that you are our God, uh, you are our Lord, you are our Savior, and we are eternally grateful for what you have done for us, what you are doing for us, and what you will do for us. Today, Lord, um, some of us came into the church with happy hearts and joyful hearts, and others of us came in stressed and worried and struggling. Wherever we're at today, Lord, we pray that you will touch our hearts and speak to us in some way. Um, encourage us with uh, a friendly smile. Teach us from your word. Uh, fill our hearts uh, with the, the joy of potluck and good food after the service uh, or a song that we have sung. We need to hear from you. We want to hear from you. And we ask you to speak to us and through us. Lord, I pray for our members that are sick. I pray for Gwen, who just yesterday broke her ankle. Uh, we pray that you will ease her pain and help her, her ankle to heal quickly. Um, we pray that she can join us again in the near future. Um, we have many members that are unable to make it today. Uh, many of them watching from home. And we're grateful uh, that they're still able to participate. We pray that you'll bless them in their homes with a special blessing today. So, Lord, we ask you uh, to use us uh, to be your lighthouse. Uh, give us opportunities to make a difference in the lives of someone this week. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. In the world of skiing or extreme sports, there's sometimes a phrase when somebody just doesn't hold back. And when they go and hit the jump full speed without any fear or hesitation, they say, oh, he went full send or maximal send. Somebody who just goes full speed ahead, fully committed towards a jump or an activity, even if they end up failing, they went full send, maximal send. And as we get back into our series through the book of Acts, it occurred to me that the apostles, filled with the spirit and the joy of the story of Jesus, the reality of the resurrection, they appear to be living full send faith uh, or maximal send ministry is what they're engaging. And I want to take a look at this next story in the narrative that Luke wrote down for us. If you have a Bible, or a phone, or you can turn to the, to the Bible in front of you in the pew. We're going to the book of Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5. What does it look like when somebody lives out their faith without hesitation or reservation? When somebody is fully committed to God and to advancing the cause of God? Acts chapter 5, we pick it up in verse 12. Uh, this is now the third little um, kind of summary about the health and the status of the church. Luke does this periodically throughout the book of Acts. And verses 12 through 16 give us this third summary of how things are going. And they're going amazingly well. Acts chapter 5, verse 12. The Bible there says, and I'm reading in the New King James Version today, but you can read whatever, whatever Bible you understand, that's the one you should be reading. 
but this is the one I'm reading from today for following along. It says, and through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done among the people. All sorts of miracles, left and right, were being performed through the apostles. We've read about some of them um, already. All sorts of amazing healings. It says, and they were with one accord in Solomon's porch. This was a part of the temple that they uh, found a habit of hanging out and teaching and preaching and, and conducting some of the business of the church. Yet, verse 13 says, none of the rest dared to join them, but the people esteemed them highly. There's kind of some confusion and uncertainty as to who the rest are, but it may simply be a reference to the fact that people recognized there at Solomon's porch, there were great things happening, but there also was persecution that was happening from the, uh, from the Sadducees, specifically. Uh, and so some, they, they were interested, but they didn't feel like they should be right there with the apostles. But nevertheless, the people enjoyed and were excited for what was happening. Verse 14, and the believers were increasingly added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women, so that they brought the sick out in the streets and laid them on beds and couches, that at least the what of Peter? The shadow of Peter passing by might fall on some of them. Now Luke doesn't tell us whether the shadow of Peter healed people or not, but people were so convinced that the power of God was working through Peter that they said, I want to be as close as I can get, even if his shadow might heal me. Look at verse 16. Also a multitude gathered from the surrounding cities of, to Jerusalem, bringing sick people and those who were tormented by unclean spirits. And how many of them were healed? All of them. So whether the shadow healed them or whether it was through words spoken directly or healing touch, God and his power was present and anybody that wanted healing was getting it. Wouldn't that be amazing? Just incredible. But you have to know that with all of these good things going on, there were people that were not excited. People that were opposing what was happening. Verse 17, then the high priest rose up. The one who was in charge of the temple. Who was in charge of helping people be, be true to the faith the faith that he was instructing them in, the faith that had not embraced Jesus. He stood up, and those who were with him, which was the sect of the Sadducees, and they were filled with indignation. Maybe your Bible says jealousy. Um, in the Greek, the word could also be the word zeal, Z-E-A-L. If you're zealous for something, you're really passionate about the cause. So they might have been jealous and envious because the disciples are doing things. The apostles are healing people that they can't heal. Uh, but they also may have simply just been concerned that, man, these people are not leading them in, in the right path, and this is our temple, and they're there in Solomon's porch, and we need to protect the faith of our fathers. Much like the apostle Paul was sincere in his faith, but sincerely misled uh, before he became Paul, when he went by the name Saul, he was persecuting the Christians because that's what he thought God wanted him to do. But thank God, Jesus got a hold of him and helped him to see what he really wanted them and him to do. But the high priests, the Sadducees, the religious leaders, they were filled with indignation, jealousy, zeal, and they laid their hands in the apostles, verse 18, and they put them where? The Bible says in the common jail or the common prison. This was not a, not a part of the temple that was unavailable or uh, unseen from spectators. This was the common place where common criminals were put, which means that people could see them there, which becomes a very important point in the, in the ironic situation that it unfolds here in the next couple verses. Everybody knows, oh, they got locked up. Here they are. They're right there if you want to go talk with them. They're in the common jail, the common prison. But verse 19 says, at night, who came visiting? An angel went on visitation and opened the prison doors and brought them out and said, go stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. Now, Luke goes sparingly on the details here. 
Other miracles, he gives more details, but this one, he doesn't give us a lot of details, and maybe it's because of the irony that's about to unfold here. But just imagine for a second, you're in prison, and an angel appears, opens the doors, the guards are sleeping or unable to see, takes you out, and then says, go and teach. Speak the words of this life. Be a pretty powerful experience, wouldn't it? Powerful. Uh, but also, I mean, would you be a little hesitant? You'd just been arrested. Go back and do the thing that got you in trouble in the first place with an uncertain fate awaiting you. But the disciples had this maximal commitment, this full send faith, and they were committed to sharing the good news about Jesus. And so that's what they did. Tell them the words of this life. What are the words of this life, this Christian life that we have? You're forgiven. You're loved. You've always been loved. You're accepted in the Father through Jesus. You have eternal life starting now. Uh, there may be troubles now, but God will help you. And eventually you have an eternal home in heaven with God forever. These words and so many words more. And so, verse 21, and when they heard that, they entered the temple early in the morning and they taught. But the high priest and those with him came and called the council together with all the elders of the children of Israel, and they sent to the where? To the prison to have them brought. They didn't know the guys you arrested are currently out preaching again. Verse 22, but when the officers came and did not find him in the prison, they returned and reported, saying, Indeed, we found the prison shut securely, and the guards were standing outside before the doors. But when we opened them, we found nobody inside. What a big shock that must have been. What a frustrating shock if you were uh, one of the guards or working for the chief priest. It says in verse 24, Now when the high priest, the captain of the temple, and the chief priest heard these things, they wondered what the outcome would be. That's quite a loaded phrase there. I wonder what's going to, what in the world is going on? They knew something was going on. They wondered how it was going to end. But then in verse 25, somebody comes and says, Hey, the guys you're wanting, they're in the temple, and they're speaking. They're teaching the people. And this just infuriated them all the more. Verse 26 says, And when the captain of the officers brought them, he went and brought them without violence. Why? Because they feared the people, lest they should be stoned. The apostles had so much favor in the eyes of the common people, and it was so obvious that God was working powerful miracles that the guards themselves, they were worried, if we, if we make a big scene here, we ourselves might be killed because the people will interpret what we're doing as resisting the very acts of God. Powerful. So we get a sense that this was not just ignorantly, you know, not knowing what's going on. It seems like they knew something special was happening, but they were unwilling to recognize it and accept it. So they brought them carefully. Verse 27, they brought them in and set them before the council. And the high priest asked them, saying, did we not strictly command you not to teach in this name? Now notice, two things that the, that the high priest does not mention. One, he doesn't say anything about, didn't we arrest you and lock you up, and how did you get out? This is probably a very embarrassing fact. And he didn't want to acknowledge this fact and the potential miracle that had caused it. So he ignores that. And then there's also something else that's a little bit odd. Didn't we strictly command you not to teach in this name? Now, what name is that? It's the name of Jesus. He doesn't even want to mention you know what name. He didn't want to mention that name. Then there's power in the name of Jesus, isn't there? There's power in this name. And then he says something that, that I interpret as a compliment. And look, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine. 
Who did Jesus tell his disciples to go to first in his commission to them? First, you go to the people that are closest. Jerusalem, and then you start working your way out. And the disciples, the apostles, had done just that. Wouldn't it be awesome if it could be said in Modesto, you're teaching about Jesus and his love and, and his return to this world and his plan for the world is filling Modesto. You filled this city with this message, with the Bible message. You filled it. Not only that, he says, you intend to bring this man's blood on us, uh, which is an Old Testament reference to uh, if the blood is brought upon you, that's bringing divine judgment, or you're guilty and worthy of death because of the blood that's been shed. Uh, you're trying to get us on the hook for the death of this man. But what were the very words of these religious leaders when Pilate didn't want to condemn him to death, and they said, give us Barabbas, and he's, no, I really don't think we should do that. What did they say? They said, his blood be upon us. And I think it's important for us to recognize that it's easy for us to point the finger at people who lived 2,000 years ago and say, oh, that was so bad. They were really bad. But have you ever resisted the workings of God in your life? Have you ever sensed the Holy Spirit prompting you to go one way, prompting you not to do something or to do something, and you said, nah, I'm good. I'm good, God. Nah, it's okay. It's really easy for us to have the same spirit as the religious leaders of those days. It's easy for us to say, oh yeah, I know the Bible says, but, I mean, come on, really? That's like the religious leaders recognizing, yeah, it seems like God's working here, but I don't want to, I don't want to go along with we have to be very careful not to blame others and realize that we can be guilty of the same thing. Peter answered, verse 29, with the other apostles, we ought to obey God rather than men. He was so committed to God, he said, God's my number one priority. You guys come in second. Um, this is a very inspirational Saying, and it's been used throughout the years. We also have to be careful that we don't misuse this. Uh, there are a lot of people who would like to try to justify doing or not doing something because they feel like God has told them. Uh, I remember reading about this kind of somewhat evangelist for the Christian faith, uh, but in another sense. And he stopped paying taxes because he couldn't support what the government was doing with the tax money and what was being taught in the public schools and. And so this guy gets arrested. He think he spent like 10 years in prison uh, for tax evasion. That's not a, a winning way to apply this principle. Um, we have to be very sure, like Peter was, that when God is telling us to do something, that it's actually God and not just our selfish motives or our misunderstandings and misapplications of Scripture. I like the words of Martin Luther, that, those famous words, you probably have read them before, or some of you have heard of them. He said, my conscience has been taken captive for the word of God. He was testifying there before the, the Council of Worms in Germany. He said, I am neither able nor willing to recant, since it is neither safe nor right to act against conscience. God help. The, the church that was steeped in tradition was saying, no, you've got to stop doing, you've got to stop teaching. He said, no, 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 I am chained to the word of God. I am taken captive by the word of God. And that was the attitude of the apostles. We, we need to obey God rather than man. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you murdered by hanging on a tree. Verse 31, him God exalted to his right hand to be prince and savior, to give what? to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. This is an important point. I don't want to just pass over too lightly. Repentance is a gift 
from God. You can't repent on your own. What does repent mean? It means naturally you want to go towards sin. God says, no, 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 come the other way, and you make a life change. On your own, you can't do that. It takes a miracle. But it's a miracle that God is 100% willing to supply. He may not give you the miracle of a brand new car, although it sure would be nice, wouldn't it? But guaranteed, when you pray, he is willing and will supply the power and the spirit of repentance if you ask, if you seek. He wanted to give it to Israel. He wants to give it to you and me today. He wants to give us forgiveness, 100% for our sins. 32, and we are his witnesses to these things, that he is also, and so also is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. So the apostles, again, share this mini testimony. They, they rest their defense for their actions. Um, and then we get to verse 33. And when they heard this, how do you think they responded? They were furious. In fact, the Greek there for furious means they were cut in two. They were just so mad that, that that's how they felt. And they plotted to kill them. But one of the council stood up, a Pharisee named what? Gamaliel. Gamaliel. This guy was a Pharisee. Uh, you can read about him in some of the ancient rabbinic literature. He had a, a famous father or grandfather named Hillel. And the rabbinic tradition gives him the title Nasi, or the president of the high court. So this guy was super influential. He came from a good family. And, in fact, in the Mishnah, these um, oral traditions, it says this about Gamaliel. It says, when Rabban Gamaliel, the elder, died, the glory of the law ceased, and purity and abstinence died. So ancient Jewish tradition says, when this guy died, man, we lost so much. Uh, this guy carried a lot of weight. Uh, but Christians probably best know him because Paul or Saul, was a pupil of his. He studied under Gamaliel. Um, but um, Josephus tells us, G Josephus was an ancient Jewish historian, and he tells us that the, uh, there was the Sadducees and the Pharisees, um, but the Pharisees had more support with the popular people. Um, the Sadducees were more, we might call them more conservative, and, and the Pharisees were a little more liberal, although that's, that's an oversimplification of things. But as a Pharisee, Gamaliel could sympathize a little bit more with the apostles. The Pharisees, for example, they believed in a coming Messiah. They believed in the resurrection. They believed in life after death. But the Sadducees didn't believe in any of those things. Uh, so the Sadducees had less common ground with the apostles. Um, the, the Pharisees also were more flexible with their interpretation. Uh, while the Sadducees were very literal and strict um, in their interpretation of things. And so Gamaliel was a little bit more tolerant just naturally by his um, beliefs and upbringing. So he rises up and he gives it two examples of people who had risen up in the past and the movements had died out. He talks about a guy in verse 36 named Theudas, and we're not sure exactly who this was because there was a Theudas, Josephus mentions, but he comes in, in the story too late. So it probably was someone by the same name. And Josephus named, for example, like four guys named Simon uh, within 40 years that did similar things, and three guys named Judas within 10 years who, who led out in revolutions. So there were a lot of revolts that were going on. Um, but we do know who Judas of Galilee was. Um, he rose up about 6 A.D., and he opposed, I think, the, the taxation system that was being put in place. But the point that he makes with both of these men is that their movements died out. We should just wait and see. And if this is from God, well, we'll be working against God, and that's a really bad thing. But if it's not, if it's just from man, it'll die out on its own. But I think they already had sufficient evidence to know that this movement was not simply from God. It was definitely, or not simply from man, it was from 
God. I like his words there, verse 39. But if it is from God, you cannot overthrow it, lest you be found to fight against God. You ever feel like you're fighting against God? God's pulling you one way, and you're saying, oh, I really want to go this other way. It's helpful for me to think back in my past and remember, play the tape through. How did it go when I resisted God and I went my own way? How did it work out? Not good. Not good. So they agreed with his wisdom, verse 40. Last couple of verses here. And when they had called for the apostles and beaten them, they commanded that they should no longer speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. He beat them. They beat them. Uh, this was 39 lashes. Um, and this was, this was no slap on the wrist. This sometimes killed people. Uh, just 39 lashes. They were bare-chested. They would kneel like this, hands behind their back. Uh, for every two lashes on the back, they would do one on the front of the chest. Um, this is with a, like um, cow leather that had been folded up. And like I said, sometimes people died from these things. So when the apostles, it just says they beat them. This was the beating of their lifetime. And then they're told, don't ever mention this name ever again. So what do they do? Full send faith, maximal faith ministry, maximal send ministry, verse 41. So they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name, and daily in the temple and in every house, they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as Christ. Think about this. If you had been beaten worse than you had ever been beaten in your life, would you be tempted to change or be a little quieter or, you know, we're just going to have a ministry of prayer. We're not going to engage in active, we're just going to pray for God to work in the community. That's not what they said. Nope. We've been commissioned by God. We are 100% convinced, convinced Jesus is alive. He's our Savior. He's coming back again. He wants to save humanity, and nothing is worth holding back from for the cause of God. In your own heart, not, you know, not a raising of the hand thing, but in your own heart, on a scale of, of 1 to 10, how committed are you to the faith? If the apostles here, if, if that represents 10, where are you at? Where am I at? What would hold you back from increasing your commitment? And are those reasons and excuses good ones? When you realize we're dealing with life and death, eternal life, eternal death, the excuses that we tend to come up with, they're pretty small, aren't they? They're pretty small. And what's amazing here is the disciples got excited. I can't imagine the normal reaction to the whooping of your lifetime being rejoicing in this way. If it happened today in our society, they would say, this person is mentally disturbed. They need to be heavily medicated and perhaps locked up. But they were in their right minds, and they were so excited that they were worthy to suffer for Jesus. Not only suffer, but suffer shame. This was an honor-shame society, where to be shamed was one of the worst things. Uh, there are cultures in, in, in our world today that are still honor-shame-based. And some people commit suicide rather than bring shame on their family uh, by their secret sins being exposed. But they were excited that they could suffer and were worthy by Jesus' blood to suffer for his name. And every day, you know where you could find them. 
there in the temple, praising and teaching and preaching that Jesus was and is the Messiah. As I compare my life to these people of faith, I realize um, I'm not there. But I also recognize that a lot of the excuses I have that hold me back from greater commitment are not good ones. And I think if you're honest in your own heart, you'll recognize the same thing. I just want you to think about this as we close. Um, do you want to be more committed this week than you were last week? In your mind, if I'd planned this ahead, I would have given you a card. But in your mind, here's a sentence. In order to be more committed this week, I am going to, colon, how would you fill in the blank? In order to, be, to live a more authentic, joyful, Christian, committed life this next week, I am going to. And in your own heart, in your own mind, how, how do you finish the sentence? Maybe it involves spending more time in the Word. Uh, and make it measurable. Uh, I'm going to spend 10 more minutes in the Bible. I am going to spend 10 minutes less on my phone. 30 minutes less. I'm going to turn my electronics off at 8 p.m. Or uh, I'm just giving you some ideas here. In order to be more committed to God this week, I am going to uh, grab some glow tracks as I leave today and pass out at least X number. I am going to, and you finish the sentence. So as you think about that, um, I'm just going to have a closing prayer and let you and God finish that sentence together. But I'll bet you, in a week's time, when we pick up the story next week, if you look back and you have followed through with your commitment, I don't think you'll regret it. Do you think you'd regret it? I don't think so. And when we get to heaven someday and we look back, we're not going to say, man, I really wasted my time witnessing. I shouldn't have done that. I wasted my time on acts of mercy. <laughs> we won't say that. And there'll be people who say, thank you for what you did. So now's the time when we get to choose and we get to allow Jesus to give us repentance and to also give us greater commitment because we can't do it on our own. It's only Jesus working in and through us. So let's pray. Loving Heavenly Father, we are grateful that we are forgiven in you. We have all things in you. And we can't wait to see you face to face someday soon. In the meantime, Lord, you have a work for us to do. A joyful opportunity to let others know how good you are. So this week, Lord, show us how we can be more committed to you in practical, practical tangible ways. Give us the strength to follow through and help us to remember and not forget. This is our prayer. In Jesus' name, let everyone say, Amen and Amen.